Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In 1 Kings 17, <coughs> excuse me. In 1 Kings 17, the Lord sends the prophet Elijah to a widow in the town of Zarephath in the territory of Sidon, outside the boundaries of Israel. And there the prophet would find a widow whom the Lord had commanded to provide for him. This widow that the Lord had commanded to provide for the prophet, though, has basically next to nothing. When the prophet finds this woman, she's getting ready to prepare one final meal for herself and her son so that they would eat it and then they would die. But Elijah comes and brings them good news because, as we heard last week, with the need for daily bread, God also promises to give daily bread. He says, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. And it happened just as the word of the Lord said through Elijah. But sometime after this, then, the widow's son, her only son, becomes sick and he dies. And this widow, who had next to nothing to begin with, now has even less because her only son is dead. She's left alone in this world. No protection, no provision. She's left in her grief. And of course, she blames Elijah. Elijah takes the boy to the upper room of the house, lays him out on a bed, stretches himself over the boy three times and prays, Oh Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. And the Lord answered the prophet's prayer. He raises the boy to new life, and then Elijah takes the boy downstairs and gives him to his mother. This widow, overcome with joy at her son's resurrection, says to Elijah, Now by this I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. This sign, even more so than the sign of providing oil and flour during the drought, Prove Elijah to be a man of God, and more so, proves the word in his mouth to be the truth of God's word. In today's gospel lesson, then, we hear of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one greater than Elijah. He enters a city called Nain, and he and his disciples and the large crowd that follows him, they meet, well, they meet another large crowd, at the head of which is a funeral procession, a dead man being carried out of the city. He's a young man, the only son of his mother, and she was already a widow. She had married a husband, now she buries a son, and like the widow in Zarephath in the Old Testament, this woman is also then left alone in the world with no protection, no provision. She grieves the loss of her only son, the fruit of her former marriage, whom she, her husband, whom she loved with all her heart. The Lord sees this woman in her grief, and he has compassion upon her, as he has compassion upon all who suffer love's lasting effects after death. He sees her great love for her son. She, he sees her tremendous loss and lowliness, and he comes up to the open coffin, touches it, not to pay his respects, but to speak to the deceased. Young man, he says, I say to you, arise. Now earlier in Luke 5, 24, he had said this to the paralyzed man, I say to you, arise. And now he says this to a man who is not paralyzed, but dead. Arise, he tells them. And just as in John 5, 25, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. That day was Jesus' day. This dead young man hears the voice of his Lord Jesus, and he comes back to life. He sits up. He begins to speak. Elijah, he had to stretch himself out over the dead boy three times and ask the Lord 
that he would resurrect him, body and soul back together. But Jesus, being the very Lord to whom Elijah prayed, needs none of this. He simply tells the young man, arise, and he gets up, fully alive once again. Just as the widow of Zarephath, just as she knew that the words in Elijah's mouth were the word of the Lord, so now the crowds, the two crowds that have now converged outside of Zarephath, now they say, a great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. And God's visitation is one of mercy and is one of compassion. He is, as David says, a father of the fatherless, a defender of widows, and sets the solitary in families. He sees the wages of sin, death, and comforts those who mourn. He even says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, not with the comfort of the world, but the comfort of Jesus. The peace of Jesus, which passes all human understanding. The peace of Christ, which is the peace of his resurrection. Not only is Jesus compassionate to those who grieve the death of loved ones, as he is compassionate to this widow, but he is the answer to the death of loved ones who die in the faith. He raises this young man from the dead with a word and reunites him with his mother. It is as he told Martha, in John chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he, will, though he die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Jesus can say that, that he is the resurrection and the life, because as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. He doesn't borrow the life of God the Father. He has it in and of himself, so that he is the resurrection and the life. That's why his voice raises the dead. Elijah has to pray to God to raise the widow's son. But Jesus has no need to pray to the Father because he is the eternal Son of God. And he promises that all who die in him, in faith in him, though they die, they shall yet live even as this young man lived. He will raise them from the dead on the last day. And on that day, all who believed in Christ Jesus during their earthly lives will rise from the dead in glorified bodies like Christ's glorified body. This is what this resurrection in Luke chapter 7 reminds us of. It directs our thoughts to the last day. It directs our thoughts to Christ's resurrection and how he is the resurrection and the life for us and for all who believe. But it should also then remind us of the resurrection that happens to us in this life while we are still yet physically alive. The resurrection from the dead that he gives to each of us in holy baptism. For we were born dead in trespasses and sins. And St. Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. But just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Baptism buries us with Christ, Paul says. Our old Adam, the sinful nature, is drowned in those waters as God saves us by bringing us out through those waters as new men, as new women, as children of God. We rise out of holy baptism as the new man, as the new woman in Christ, no longer a slave to sin, Paul says, bound to serve our former master, but as slaves of righteousness to live before him in righteousness and purity. And although baptism is a one-time event in the life of the Christian, we are to live in our baptism each day. We live in our baptism by daily dying to sin through repentance, by daily rising again in faith in the gospel, 
We do this by faith in his promises that he has made to us. Luther writes in the large catechism, a truly Christian life is nothing else than a daily baptism, once begun and ever to be continued. For this must be practiced without ceasing, that we ever keep purging away whatever is of the old Adam, and that which belongs to the new man come forth. So we are to daily die to our sinful flesh. The old Adam in us must daily decrease while the new man grows in strength. And then, on the day that we die, the old Adam, our sinful nature, will be buried for the final time. It is for this increase in the baptismal life, this increase in the daily life of the resurrection that Paul prays for us in today's epistle. He prays that God would grant you to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. He prays for you and for all of the baptized that they be strengthened according to the new man, the inner man, he calls him. And this happens, as we said, through the daily putting to death of sin, repenting of it but also being rooted and grounded in love. Not rooted and grounded in our love for neighbors, but rooted and grounded in Christ's love for us, that we may be able, he writes, to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. The daily drowning of the old Adam, the daily putting to death of the sinful passions, desires and temptations must be accompanied by comprehending the love of Christ by faith in the gospel. It's not a life merely of saying no and abstaining from sin. It is a life of abstaining from sin by the power of the Holy Spirit and growing in the knowledge and appreciation of Christ's great love and compassion for us. It's because when we are comprehending when we are growing in that appreciation of Christ's love for us, when we consider its width, its depth, its height, its fullness, then by faith, trusting in that great mercy and compassion, that's what fills us with the fullness of God, the fullness of his love, the fullness of his joy. And that's why we're to daily meditate on the gospel. We're to daily meditate upon his great compassion. We see a small picture of that compassion in the gospel lesson when Jesus looks at this mourning, grieving woman and is moved with compassion to help her. We see this compassion here in his service where he feeds us with his word, where he feeds us with his very flesh and blood and his sacrament to forgive our sins, to strengthen us in the inner man so that we daily comprehend more and more his love, so that we see his compassion, that we see how he looks at you in the midst of your afflictions, that he wants to comfort you, that he wants to help you. Look at Jesus' resurrection of this young man. That's why Christ Jesus, that's what he did for you when he baptized you. That's what he does for you each day. He calls you by name. And he calls you to arise by his gospel. And he strengthens you with might in the inner man so that you might live the Christian life in righteousness and purity and joy. Loving God, loving neighbor, and loving yourself as a baptized child of God. As we make this prayer of St. Paul's our prayer, for that's why he does this, we know that God will answer it. For Paul says he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that is at work in us. And he shows us today again that almighty power by raising that young man to new life. That is the same almighty power that is at work in you through the gospel. If God can raise the physically dead in their bodies with a word, then he can most surely raise you up each day to the new life of faith from the death of sin. His power at work in us, 
His Holy Spirit working through the gospel to strengthen our inner man, that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith, that we may be rooted and grounded in Christ's love, that is his goal for us each day, that we grow in that, and that the old man in us decrease, so that our love for the triune God and for those around us may increase as well. And so we look forward to our resurrection on the last day and the resurrection of our loved ones who have died in the faith. But until that day, we prepare for it by daily dying to ourselves and by daily experiencing the resurrection of the inner man, his growth and his strength by meditating upon what Christ has done for us, what he continues to do for us, and what he will do for us in the gospel on the last day. Amen. May the peace of God, which far surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.